Welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you out there. Amen. It's watching us by social media. May God richly bless you and your families. Today we want to talk about the prodigal son. It's in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. The reason why I chose this scripture is because most of us can identify with someone in this scripture. We can identify with the older brother, or the younger son, or even the father. And we know today we're celebrating Father's Day, and we know that we've got the best father of all, amen, amen. God himself. The Bible says he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. No greater love can anyone show than to lay down his own life for a friend. So we have a father and we have an elder brother named Jesus that gave his life so that we could have life and that more abundance. The prodigal son, or the lost son, was an abuser of grace. Grace is most often defined as unmarried or unearned favor. He had a loving father, a good home, provisions, a future, and an inheritance, but he traded it all for temporal pressures. Know anybody like that today? We are the prodigal son. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and now is alive. He was lost and now he is found. That's found in Luke 15, 32. The prodigal son. Like I said, most of us can identify with that. We've been lost. All of us have been lost. All of us have sinned and come short the glory of God. All of us were born into sin. So all of us needed a Savior. How many knows that? Amen. We can't be some self-righteous individual or somebody that thinks good deeds are going to get us to heaven because that's not going to happen. The only way we're going to get in, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the life. Amen. Amen. No man cometh to the Father except through me. So the only way we're going to get to the Father is through Jesus. And I thank God this morning for loving fathers that that bring their children and their families to church. I've seen a uh, thing on Facebook today, 93% of homes, amen, that are led by a godly father, their family become believers. 93%. And then when it drops down, just the mother drops way down, and it drops down to the children, it drops way down. So father is very important in the house of God. And, and we ought to realize that. You know, today there's a lot of fathers out there doing a lot of things that, that are not teaching their children anything except things in the world. But let me assure you, things in the world are not going to get you to heaven. Amen. You know, temporal things. This is what the prodigal son thought. He thought, well, if I just go ahead and take the inheritance now, what I get, and in the Bible and in Jewish tradition, you'll find out that the eldest son always got double. He got a double portion of the inheritance. So the younger son only got one portion. And he figured, well, I'll take that portion now. It really wasn't his to take because the father was still alive. You don't get the inheritance until the father is deceased. But he took his inheritance. How many realizes that? And then he took a journey, the Bible says. And he went out and spent every penny of the money that he had received for his inheritance on riotous living. I look around today and I wonder how many fathers are out there spending everything on riotous living. We are given a job as men and fathers to raise up our children in a godly manner. We are to be examples to them and lead them to Christ. But here we find that this young man, even though he was living out there in sin, going out there and having, you know, relationships with harlots and everything else, and eventually found himself in a pig pen and realized, hey, the hogs are eating better than I'm eating. And that's, that's just what it is. In the world, you're going to find out the hogs eat better than you eat. In the world, you'll find out that the devil's not your friend, even though he seems to 
get people deceived into believing that. But he does not your friend. He wants to see you in hell because that's where he's going. And he realizes each and every one of us are created by God. And we're created in the image and the likeness of God himself. Amen. So, so we got to realize today on Father's Day that we need to be that example, that example that shows our family that we love the Father and that we're going to be obedient to the Father. And we're going to continue to follow in the Father's ways. This young man didn't do that. Took his money and left. But then he came to himself, the Bible says. With the stench of pigs on his body, he came to himself and he wanted to go back to the father's house. Now he didn't want to go back to the father's house as a son. He wanted to go back as a servant because he felt like he was unworthy to be a son. I mean, after all, he took everything that it was coming to him early, spent it on riotous living. Now he felt like, well, if I'm going to get back to the Father's house, the servants are eating real good. I'll just go and ask if I can work for the Father and become a servant. But the Word of God lets us know that that's not what the Father did. The Father, amen, welcomed the Son back in. He welcomed him back in. He put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, a robe on him, some clean clothes, and then he killed the fatted calf to have a party. Amen. It just gives us an example this morning of, of how it is in heaven when one sinner comes back to God. One sinner comes back to the Lord. All of heaven rejoices because God wants everyone to be saved. Amen. How many knows that? Amen. It says it's not His will that any should lost, not His will that any should perish, but that all should come to life through Christ His Son. He said, if any of us come to him, he would in no wise cast us out. And people think today because they have a difficult time in life, they can figure it out for themselves or they can go to psychiatrists, psychologists, and all different types of people and take all kinds of drugs and alcohol and everything else to try to drown their troubles. I remember when I was a sinner, that's what we called it. Drowning our troubles. But you know what? They don't drown. They come back up. And they come back up with a vengeance. Amen. And they, they will take you places where you don't want to go. One person says sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and make you pay more than you want to pay. Amen. Yep. And that's exactly what it is. And people just seemingly don't understand that. But we need to realize that. And we need to realize that God loves us so much that He's willing to take us back. There's nothing you've done that God can't forgive, just like this young man. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing that when the young man came back, Brother Charles, the, the father didn't say, what did you do? What did you spend that money on? I mean, that was your inheritance, but it cost me a lot. I had to work a lot of long hours to be able to provide that for you. What did you do? You smell like you've been in a pig pen. Where have you been? What have you done? No, he didn't say none of that stuff. He said, this is my son. He was lost. And now he's found. Amen. He was dead, but now he's alive. Amen. Didn't ridicule him. Didn't, you know, belittle him. Didn't do any of those things. He just said, welcome home. Yes. Welcome home. And then you got the older son who was always there at the father's Amen. farm, estate, always doing the father's business. And now this younger son that come and wasted everything that he had coming to him, now he's going to come back and he wants some more. Amen. So the older son is upset and he's mad. And he wouldn't even go into the party. And the father had to come out to him, tell him, you know, all this time you've been with me, and everything that I have is yours. See, a lot of times we miss that. The younger son already got his portion. The two portions left belonged to the older son. It was all his. He could have had a party any time. He could have killed him a goat, killed him a fatty calf, done whatever he wanted to. It belonged to him, and that's exactly what his father said. 
And his father said, why are you so upset? This was your brother. He's lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. Rejoice with us. Amen. That he came home. He's safe and sound. But no, he wouldn't do that. You know, he thought that he was someone like a lot of people we have today, self-righteous. You know, I've done a lot of good deeds, so I'm going to heaven. You ever run into those people? Hmm? I mean, I give to the poor, you know, and I, I do this, and I love animals, and I, I do that, and everything else, but I haven't came to Jesus. I don't know the Lord as Lord and Savior of my life. That's the only way you're going to get into heaven. If you try to come any other way, the Bible says you're a thief and a robber, and you're not going to make it in. So I thank God, amen, that, that this example was given and it was given in the context where there were different people there. Uh, the audience was a mixture of sinners and, and, and those that thought they were righteous, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and he tells these stories to them, trying to make them realize that self-righteousness is no righteousness at all. That, that just because you think you're good doesn't mean you're good. I mean, you know, all the good that we could ever do is not getting us to heaven. What we need is grace, and that's what was given to us. Grace. Grace is unmerited favor, undeserved favor, but we still have favor in God. How many can say amen? amen. And, and we realize that, that the Father <coughs> so loved His Son that when He came home, He threw His arms around Him and let Him know just what He meant to Him. Today, we need to realize, Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For it is grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were trusting in a work-based justification rather than experiencing salvation by God's grace through faith. Like her older brother in the parable, they viewed themselves as worthy sons. Unless we see ourselves as unworthy, we cannot possibly fall upon the grace of God unless we realize that we are spiritually destitute. We will never be saved. It is only the needy who reach out for help are saving. Blessed are the pure poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, found in Matthew 5, 3. The importance of both brothers in the parable of the prodigal son is that our sermon can focus on the younger brother, and most of them do, the brother who physically ran away from home. Often when we hear the parable, perhaps we can identify with one of the two. Maybe we're like the older brother who snubs the grace given to him by his father. Even though he's home, he truly is not home because he's not taking advantage of what God has given him or what the Father has given him. And when the party starts, he refuses to go to celebrate the return of the lost son. Or perhaps we identify more with the youngest son. Like him, we had squandered our wealth and ran as far away from the church and the faith as much as possible. Some of us may even identify with the father figure in the story. Maybe we have family members who have gone astray or want nothing to do with us and our Christian but faith. Even though many of us have heard the parable of a multitude of times, we can always glean new lessons from the story. We likely know someone in our lives who feel a strong connection to one of the two characters. But in terms of the sons, we need to realize that both sons are prodigals. No amount of righteous work can ever earn us a spot in heaven. The older son abused the grace the father had given him. He thought that because he stayed behind, he had earned his inheritance. As Christians, we need to analyze our hearts to see if something similar has happened to us. Do we think we've earned grace, the grace of God? Do we think ourselves superior to other prodigal sons who return home? If so, ask to God to transform your, uh, transform your heart and join in the celebration that a lost son has returned home. The prodigal son or lost son was an abuser of grace. Grace is most often defined 
has unmerited earned, unearned favor. He had a loving father, a good home, provision, a future inheritance, but he traded it all in for temporal pleasures. We are the prodigal son. Derek Bonhoeffer, a great man of God, made this statement. Cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. We, amen, don't preach cheap grace here. Amen. 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 We preach the entire Bible, the Word of God. Amen. And we preach it, amen, not because we're trying to beat somebody over the head with rules and commandments and everything else. We want to teach you mostly that God loves you. And the Bible says if you love God, You'll keep what God has called you to do. Yeah. Amen. His gifts and His callings without repentance. The prodigal son came home. He was accepted by the Father. Even though you may have went out and you may have done all these worldly things, God still is in heaven waiting for your return. Oh, Amen. Yeah. doesn't want any of you to, to get out there and, and lose your eternal life. Sometimes we realize, amen, that, that this life that we're living now is very short, very limited. But eternity is forever. Yes. Our finite mind can't even comprehend what eternity is. I mean, if we could, I think, uh, I think the church would be full today and overflowing. Because when people realize they're either going to heaven for eternity or hell for eternity, there'd be a whole lot of folks changing their minds. We're living today in a society where it's become a godless society. A survey said the other day that, that Christians in America are fewer now than ever before. The decline started in the 60s and it's just kept on plummeting. That's why today you see churches growing up, and weeds are growing all around them and everything else. There's nobody there. And, and it's amazing. But if we had men, real men, see, but we, we've taken men away from what they should be. Because now they don't want you to be masculine. They don't want you to be a real man. They want you to realize, you know, that, that you ought to be dominated. But that's not the Word of God. The Word of God says you're the priest of your household. Amen. You men are the ones that should rule the house. You are to guide the house. Amen. Yes, you are to love your wives as Christ loves the church, but also you ought to be the one that makes the major decisions. You ought to be the ones that, that allows, amen, your family to realize we're going to church. You know, Joshua didn't say, as for me and my house, when I get my wife's approval, we're going to serve God. Or as for me and my house, when my children say it's okay, we're going to serve God. No, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. He had made up his mind that him, his wife, and his children were all going to serve the Lord. Yeah. There wasn't going to be no debate. And that's what's happening today in the homes. That's why we say, see so much that is taken away from the church. They're being taught in school things that they shouldn't be taught. Then they bring it home and pitch a little fit and don't want to go to church and Parents give in because they don't want to hurt their ego and everything else. I wouldn't hurt their ego. I'd turn them upside down and give them a good whacking. But, but, you know, they don't do that no more. That's called child abuse. Well, I guarantee you my mom and dad were child abusers because we sure got some good beatings. Amen. Amen. And the thing is, uh, Brother Fred, if you do it right the first time, you don't have to repeat it many times. Because they realize... Amen. Did you mean business? But what do we have today? We got fathers that say, you can't do that. I told you to stop that. You can't do that. I told you to quit that. You can't do that. Wait a minute. Don't do that. You're going to get one. You're going to get a whooping. Don't do that. And it's on and on and on and on. All they know you as is a liar. Well, you shouldn't just say, do not do that. If you do, you're going to get it. And then follow through. 
Right. Then they know that you tell them the truth. Yeah. So the next time when you tell them something, they realize, well, if I go a step further, I'm done. Amen? Amen. And, and when you know, when you get grown, just like this prodigal son here, when you get grown, you're able to do whatever you want to do. But he found out the hard way that it was real good where he was at, and he left it and found out that the world wasn't so easy on him. Yeah. That the devil wasn't so kind to him. Yeah. And found himself in that pig pit. Would have been eating the husk of the corn just like the pigs, but nobody would feed him. Let me assure you, folks, that world holds nothing for you. But God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son for you, for me, for all of us. Did we deserve it? No. It's unmerited favor. It's grace. Amen. But to just tell people about grace and tell them that they don't have to abide by the Word of God is totally wrong. Because we do have to abide by the Word of God. And I know some preachers today are not preaching like they used to preach. They're not telling the folks like they used to tell them. They're so worried about nickels and noses. Amen. Look around. We ain't got too much to be concerned about on that part. Amen. I don't know how long it will take me to run the rest of y'all. Amen. My, uh, my cousin used to say, I never filled up many churches, but I made a few of them out. Amen. But the old days, preaching that was hard, what they call hard preaching now was, was the preferred preaching. I mean, folks would come out to church to hear hell hot. Amen. They want, they want to know that God loves them, but they want to know there's consequences for the actions that they get out there in the world. They want to know and realize that there is a hell and also a heaven. So thank God for heaven. And I want to stay away from hell. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So when you look at the world today, you look at the children of the world today, and, and I mean, it's just, it's, it's berserk. It's crazy. Children holding up signs, I wish my mother would have aborted me. What kind of nonsense that is. Or telling kindergartens that, that they... They're, they don't know what gender they are. Seriously? They don't have to know what gender they are in kindergarten. They, teachers have no business teaching anything about that. That should be kept in the home. And that's where fathers and mothers come in to teach their children in a godly way. Because the Bible says if you teach them in a godly manner, even if they leave, when they get older, they will return. Because they know you told them the truth and the world has told them a lie. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So we celebrate all the fathers today and we appreciate you coming out and being with us. And, and all you women that's lucky to have these men that do go to church. And, amen. amen. Come on, give yourself a hand to that. It is wonderful. If you got a man that will bring you to church, a man that will love God and, and stand by you through thick and thin, you got a good thing. The Bible says if a man finds a wife, he finds it a good thing. But if, if she ain't in church and don't want to do right, he just got a thing. Amen. It ain't good. But we appreciate, we appreciate the women of the church. We appreciate the men of the church. And I pray that God begin to build this house. Because you know what? If God doesn't build the house, all of us labor in vain. Would you stand to your feet this morning? I'm going to get you out early so you can spend time with your family because some of you come and your family's not coming to church with you. So we want to get you out early so you can get with them and celebrate Father's Day. And maybe next Sunday get them in church with you. Amen. I mean, Brother Fred brought a gentleman here today just by talking to him at a car show. Amen. Every, every time you get an opportunity to present Christ to somebody, ask my wife. You'll see me sitting at a table talking to somebody about Jesus, or, or I'm walking around the mall and I'll talk to somebody about Jesus, you know. Uh, or she threw a $20 uh, track down, and the guy picked it up and was chasing her. <laughs> Chasing her down, trying to tell her she lost her $20 bill. And I went back and explained to her to him that was a trap. Asked him if he knew Jesus. He said, I'm a Muslim. I said, I didn't ask him that. 
Ask if you knew Jesus. Amen. Because Jesus is the only one that's going to get you to heaven. Muhammad didn't die in your sins. Muhammad says if you don't die, you don't get into heaven. Amen. Jesus said he died for your sins. And because he died for your sins, you're going to live eternally with him. So praise God for that. Amen. All right. We're going to...